We begin on the bridge, where Paris and Kim are trying to guess Tuvok's age. That's not going to advance the plot, though, so we drop it in favour of finding something in our path. Mood lighting is engaged, but we needn't have bothered. The fleet of vessels turns out to be a junkyard. We could point out the flaw of placing fences along a single plane in 3D space, but we're early in the episode, so let's give it a chance. The owner of the scrap heap calls to trade, perhaps unable to believe his luck that someone, anyone, has managed to find him after apparently choosing to set up his business in the middle of fucking nowhere. This guy looks interesting, so let's stick a name on him. For the unaware, patrons can suggest names, and through the power of random chance, we'll throw one at a minor character whenever I can be asked. Junkyard Dealer's new name is... Well, the conspiracy people are definitely going to think that one's a fix. Junkyard Dealer's new name is Muffler Bearing, suggested by Commander Sean Condon. We invite Muffler Bearing over, and he immediately clocks Neelix as a fellow trader. We originally found Neelix picking over his own shit heap five years ago, if you recall, so perhaps like recognises like. Chicote thinks there might be one or two items in Muffler Bearing's inventory to interest us, and leaves Neelix with the job of ambassador for trade. While they negotiate, Seven, Paris, and Kim are browsing the derelicts on the big screen in Astrometrics. Both Seven and Kim have low opinions of the collection, but Paris hones in on something that looks like a shuttlecraft mixed with a pedalo mixed with a pile of shite. It's a new toy, and that means Paris wants it. So much so that he argues in favour of buying it when Chicote is going over the list of trades. It won't cost much, and it has a brainial interface that makes it more responsive than any of the shuttles we already have. With a bit of luck, that means he'll be able to crash it twice as fast. Muffler Bearing seems almost reluctant to part with it. Almost. With a note that all trades are final, which is definitely something you say when you're confident about what you just sold, Muffler Bearing departs. The new ship is in the shuttle bay, with Paris and Kim working on it. Alice, the name Paris has given the ship, could be generously described as a fixer-upper, or ungenerously described as a big barrel of wank. Just getting it running has proven to be a challenge, many of its components having been fried. Some more poking provides basic power, so Paris has a fiddle with that brainial interface. That brings everything fully online, briefly, anyway. A couple more overloads convince Kim, and subsequently Paris, to give it a rest. He bids Alice good night and leaves, meaning he's not there when the computer reboots and shows a picture of Paris's head. A scan of his brain and analysis of his speech is followed by the computer taking on the voice of a woman. I'm sure Balana won't have a single problem with this. As Paris is dicking around on a tablet back in his quarters, he hears a voice call his name. Some chasing of silver-clad buttocks leads him to the shuttle bay, where an off-camera but visible-to-Paris voice introduces herself as Alice. That brainial interface would appear to be more than simply a way of controlling the ship. Whatever cracked off in the cargo bay has got Paris eagerly working on Killdozer. I mean Sally. I mean Christine. I mean Alice! We have a work montage with Paris repairing and cleaning the ship, ending with him changing into a suit that would have looked futuristic in 1930. Still, he's pleased with it. At least I assume that's why he's smiling straight at the camera. Kim catches up with him in engineering, where he's poking a screen and talking to himself. If that seems like unusual behaviour to Kim, he doesn't show it, nor does he ask why Paris is wearing a suit design from Alice's database instead of his uniform. Perhaps he cares more about having been stood up for a Captain Proton holodeck date. Huh, I thought Bellana would be the first one to get jealous. Paris turns him down to carry on working, which, frankly, should have been a sufficient red flag to get him rushed to sickbay. Instead, Kim stomps off to play second fiddle all on his own. It seems Alice is not the only part of that trade deal to be problematic. Seven visits Neelix to complain that the star charts they purchased are utter wank, and she's not alone in being disappointed. Neelix bought what he was told were cultural artefacts from him, but now thinks he got robbed. Not entirely, says Seven, as one of the items contains a crystal worth a small fortune to certain buyers, something that Muffler Bearing must have been unaware of when making the trade. At least they got scammed by somebody incompetent enough to make it worth their while. Paris arrives to request a bottle of champagne. Alice is ready, so he wants to hit it with something to celebrate. That's always struck me as a curious custom, but then you could say the same about many of the things normal people do. Anywho, he's going to introduce Balana to Alice. 
I'll admit the ship has scrubbed up nicely, though from this angle, the nose does make me think of Sniff It from Super Mario Bros. 2. The celebration starts out well enough before turning to complete shit. They're talking about going for an inaugural flight once it's all finished, but a minor fault in the environmental systems draws Paris's attention away. She tries to help, but Paris reacts defensively because Tom Paris is a mind-controlled dick. Tiring of the treatment, she leaves, only to receive a minor shock from the door. Alice, it seems, doesn't want her here either. Paris's obsession with Alice isn't just affecting his relationship with Balana. He's pissy with Chicote when a request for parts is denied, and we learn he's been shirking his duties, too. Oh, and Chicote wants him to stop dressing like a shit cosplay Cyberman as well. We already ripped off the Sontarans in the last episode, so we need to be careful of the BBC's lawyers. Paris seems to listen to reason and agrees to put his pet project on hold for a while. Alice herself, who's now visible to us, takes this news badly. She wants to be repaired and go for a flight, and she tries to coax Paris into blowing off everything else to make it happen. The Paris of season one or two might have done it, but this one's slightly less of a dick, and he explains that he can't turn his back on Voyager. Alice relents, or appears to at least. She invites him into the ship for a rest, and hey, why doesn't he plug himself in while he's here? It's not more mind-control, honest. <sighs> Which is how a totally not more mind-controlled Paris is crawling through Jeffrey's tubes, grabbing the parts that Chakotay told him he couldn't have from Voyager's backup systems. Feels like that's more likely to get spotted than just nicking the ones he mentioned from a cargo bay, but what do I know? Paris is still feeling a bit weird about all of this, but lets himself be convinced by Alice. So convinced that he visits Astrometrics to plan a route for tomorrow's flight. Seven interrupts and wants to know what he's doing, so Alice coaches Paris on the best way to lie to her before he makes his escape. Escape may not be quite so easy from Balana. While she's talking to Kim about Paris and his new obsession, she finds that some parts from backup systems are missing, and she knows just who was looking for spare parts recently. She tries to find him in the shuttle bay, but he isn't there. What is there is one of the missing parts. An exploration of the interior is pretty brave considering what the door handle did to her last time, but she does it anyway. Obviously, the ship tries to kill her by locking her in and venting all the air. Her comm badge doesn't work either, so it's lucky that Paris stops by and finds her. A bit of an argument doesn't help to calm Balana, and she scarpers to tell Janeway about the murder ship in their shuttle bay. To be fair, trying to kill his partner is enough to convince Paris that things might not be 100% legit. He tries to visit Sigbay to get himself checked over and examine this brainial interface thing, much to the disapproval of Alice. Persuasion fails, so Alice moves on to a bit of the old torture instead. Go to the shuttle bay and fly away, or do a dead. The approach proves more convincing, and Paris complies. Balana's trying to convince Janeway that her recent set to with Paris was more than just their usual fiery nature, and that Alice has something to do with it. She's sceptical, but agrees to the doc giving Paris a check. Not any time soon, though, as Paris has just scarpered in Alice. Five years in, and we still don't know how to lock the fucking doors on the shuttle bay. Frankly, Tuvok should be on a charge at this point. Attempts to bring him back fail, helped in no small part by Alice convincing him to fully connect to her so they can operate as one. When the pooping is all finished, he's legged it and Voyager doesn't know where. Time to register a complaint. No refunds is one thing, but selling as a mind-control murder ship is quite another, so we're off to call muffler-bearing an asshole. He gets a bit pissy at us and some threats are traded, until Neelix steps in with that crystal he sold us by accident. An offer to return it in exchange for information is enough to make Muffler Bearing spill his guts, and he visits us for a chat. The previous owner of Alice told him that it was haunted, something he dismissed, though probably not until after negotiating a lower price. Muffler Bearing starts to talk about his own experience with Alice, until she appears to him as a member of his species, and he grabs his head before having a nap. The Doc is able to sort him out, and we learn that he has the same brainial stuff going on as was found in Alice. Reassurance that Alice won't be bothering him any more is enough to get Muffler Bearing talking. Alice needs a pilot to function, but he wasn't skilled enough to fulfil the task. As to the question of what task Seven calls with the answer, she's managed to recover the flight plan that Paris was working on, and we see it ends in a swirly. 
a particularly dangerous swirly, according to Janeway, of a type that's claimed multiple Starfleet ships. That must be why Alice chose Paris. I can think of nobody better equipped for successfully crashing into something. Voyager scoots over to the swirly to try and catch Paris. Politely asking him if he wouldn't mind not flying into it fails, so we poop at him instead. Slight problem, he's connected to the ship, meaning any damage is buggering up his brain. Tuvok can do a science to their shield so we can teleport him off, but Paris and Alice would notice, so we need to keep them distracted. A different science to the brainial interface will let us connect a third person, which seems like a bloody awful idea to me, but Janeway wants to throw Balana into it. Paris gets to be the centre of attention in a threesome, but in the most Paris way possible, because they're both shouting at him. Alice figures out that Voyager is buggering up her shields, but can't convince Paris to do anything about it because of Balana's interference. He's teleported away as Alice tumbles into the swirly and kabooms, and yes, I'm going to count that as another shuttle that Paris has crashed. Dickhead. Later, back on Voyager, Paris is patched up and receiving a threat of violence from Balana if he doesn't take it easy. We leave him to apologise, again, for her being secondary to one of his hobbies as we fly away. Oh, Paris. You're a difficult one. I want to like you as the way that you're broken isn't really your fault, but you keep on falling back to that pattern of being a dick. Now, you probably think that's a harsh assessment, and I'm certainly not suggesting it's his fault that he was possessed by a malevolent AI, but the AI wasn't the cause of him zeroing in on the ship and wanting a new toy, was it? Again, you might think that's a harsh assessment. A fast and manoeuvrable little runabout might prove useful for the adventures they keep getting themselves into. I think it's naive to suggest that this was his primary motivation, though. Indeed, this conclusion is backed up by Balana herself. She asks Kim why she always becomes a secondary consideration when Paris goes off on one of his tangents. We know he did that with his hollow car and to an extent with the Delta Flyer, but that line from Balana suggests there have been more. But even then, I can't bring myself to fully condemn him for that lack of consideration. As I said, he's broken in his own way, and that wasn't through any fault of his. If you're a disappointment to those around you, then you try and limit the people around you and become independent. Perhaps that tendency towards spending less time around Balana is even a misguided attempt to avoid destroying their relationship. Again, if being around people makes you a disappointment to them, then there's a crooked form of logic that concludes not being around her as much would prevent that. Maybe it's even more simple than that, and he's still struggling to convince himself that he deserves what he's been given. Expecting that behaviour to switch overnight is unrealistic, even with the support of people who are willing to accept him for who he is, rather than condemn him for who he's not. We won't recap that childhood again here, but we will repeat that Admiral Paris is a proper asshole who has much to answer for. There is a special place in Grethor for such overbearing parents. So you see, I desperately want to like Paris, and he's certainly not the utter cockend he was in Season 1. In some ways, he offers many of the things I wanted from Voyager. He's got an actual character arc, and it's been a slow burn, too. There is definite growth here, that rarest of prizes on the show. Perhaps I should take a leaf from my own assessment, and accept him for what he is, rather than condemning him for what he's not. End of episode. Right, so we can kill Paris on the holodeck, if we can make it funny enough for the god who controls the mortality fail safes. That's right. So, what holodeck programs does he use? Well, there was that car he was working on, but he's not doing that anymore. Wouldn't have been funny enough anyway, just squashing him won't do it. What else? Those Captain Proton things? That won't work, he usually does those with that other guy, Henry something, I think he's no. What else? What about that pub of his? The one where he parades his abandonment issues and thinks it makes him look masculine. He don't use that one anymore. Shame, really. Death by Schnoo would probably have been funny enough. Woof. <laughs>